Well, hello. My name's Nigel Parker and I'm the Senior Minister here at St Paul's Anglican Church and I'd like to welcome you to our online service today, this October the 24th, uh, the 30th Ordinary Sunday of the Year. Today we're going to be continuing in our series in self-esteem and we're going to be considering how we are fully forgiven, uh, how that comes to us through our God and I trust that's going to be encouraging to you. And as we begin the service, let's join with the psalmist who says this in Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. We rejoice with our God today, don't we? He is a good God and he keeps us and he cares for us and he looks after us. We're going to hear a great hymn now. This is uh, Before the Throne of God Above. As I've said, today we're going to be considering the issue of forgiveness. And it's right and proper that we as God's people come to our God and throw ourselves upon his mercy as we recognise that we are sinful and that we require his forgiveness. So we're going to do that now as we come and we confess our sins, acknowledging our need of him and his mercy. And so we do that in this prayer. Heavenly Father, 
You have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and broken your laws. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you more and more through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And of course, the wonderful news that the Bible brings to us is, is that our God is a forgiving God. He loves to forgive the repentant sinner and he does that and we are now forgiven. And so we rejoice in the freedom and the hope that we have in our God's mercy. We're going to go to prayer shortly, but just some things for your attention uh, by way of notice. Now, of course, excitingly, next Sunday, October the 31st, at 8.30 a.m. and 10.15 a.m., we're going to be able to have our physical services here at St. Paul's. We're going to meet in the church hall, uh, but of course there are a few things, guidelines that we need to observe as we meet together, and they're just here for you. We're going to need to check in, to QR check in as we arrive and give a well-being affirmation. Please don't come if you're not feeling well. Uh, we're going to need to hand sanitize on entry and exit of the building. There'll be four meter square seating, and we want people to observe 1.5 metre social distancing. Unfortunately, we can't sing and we'll need to wear a face mask at all times. As well as that, we're going to need to maximise the building ventilation by keeping the windows open and we're going to complete a thorough indoor cleansing of the building after we've finished our services. And at this time, we're going to hold off on morning tea. Those are the conditions upon which we're able to meet. Uh, please come along if you're able. Uh, be great to see you at that time. Also, this coming up this term we have on Sunday, November the 14th, our fourth term gift day, and we're going to be supporting the work of CMS in this special offertory. Also, uh, in December, we're going to be supporting Anglicare with their Toys and Tucker appeal. And uh, we'll give you more information about that in time, uh, but that's something we do every year and it's a great way of supporting people in need. Also on Saturday, November the 27th, we're going to have a bit of a working bee around the church property. Uh, that'll be from 8am till 12 noon. If you can come along, that would be great. Just spare an hour or more. Uh, bring your tools and your protective clothing. That would be great if we can join in that together. If you have any other needs, any other concerns, please don't hesitate to call me on my mobile 0410 263 682. As I say, we're going to prayer now, and Murray is going to lead us in that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Murray, and I'll be leading us in prayer this morning. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10, David says these wonderful words of praise to our God. Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel. From everlasting to everlasting, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honour come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hand are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Let's pray to our glorious God. Heavenly Father, Thank you that you are great and glorious and majestic. The entire universe is yours, and still you care for us. Lord, thanks that you give us good things, wealth and abilities and honour. Thanks that you work through us. Please, Lord, help us to be generous with what you have given us in whatever ways that we can. Lord, thank you that you dwell with your people, that you establish the tabernacle and then the temple to remind Israel of your presence with them. Thank you that your word tells us that you are the God who dwells with us, that we can remember Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you that Jesus took on flesh, that he took on our sin, that he brings us back into your presence. Thanks that in Christ we can look forward to when you will again dwell with us in the new creation. Thanks that for us today, you dwell with us now by your Holy Spirit, Thank you that you are with us and continue to change us for your glory. Lord, as we prepare to meet together in person next week, we pray for our church services. 
Please be with Nigel as he plans what they will look like with all the different restrictions in place. Fill us all with great joy as we see one another and gather to worship you in person. But fill us too with a greater longing for the day when we will see you face to face. Uh, Lord, as we return to our in-person services, give us all boldness and opportunities to speak about you to those around us. Please give us the chance to invite others to join us as we remember what you have done for us by sending Jesus to our world. Lord, we pray that your gospel may be declared loud and clear despite ongoing social distancing measures. Please, Lord, as we prepare to return, be at work bringing people to St Paul's and more importantly, into your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for the chance to think about self-esteem these weeks and pray that you will continue to guard our hearts and help us to think rightly about ourselves and about who you are and what you have done for us in your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we will continue to pray in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus' blood and righteousness No merit of my own I claim But wholly lean on Jesus' name On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground Is sinking Thank you. 
up. We'll continue with the words of this simple creed together. With all Christians everywhere, we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, who made everything, sent his Son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus rose again as Lord of all and will return in glory to judge and to save. God sent his Holy Spirit to live in us that we might grow to be more like Jesus. Amen. As we come to hear from God's word, let me pray for us that it will do its work in our hearts. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading for this morning is a great psalm, Psalm 103. Let me read. Of David. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions for us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And our New Testament reading is from Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 1 to 18. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. 
Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as we come to God's word, let me lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are a God who speaks because you have spoken and you have most fully spoken in your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our hope and our salvation. Father, now as we turn to your good word, we pray, Father, that you will build us in faith and trust and obedience and repentance. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we are, this term, considering the concept of self-esteem. As I mentioned last week, self-esteem as a concept, it's not really in the Bible as such. But how we feel about ourselves, psychologically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, that feeling about ourselves is a normal part of human experience. Yet the potential danger of focusing on self-esteem is the, that human ability to become self-obsessed and in that to exclude our God. And this is why we are considering our self-esteem this term by seeing ourselves as God sees us, by looking through the prism of God's word to see ourselves as he does, which is to say rightly. We, begin, we began the series two weeks ago in Psalm 139, thinking on how we are wonderfully made by our majestic God. In our human makeup and creatureliness, we, tr we are truly miracles of God's goodness, creativity and power. Then last week, we faced the truth and reality that we as humans are deeply fallen. This is a monumental attribute of humanity, deeply affecting our self-esteem. Our sin is, is that we defy God. All humanity, all of us, do so following in the spiritual footsteps of our forebears, Adam and Eve. We resist God and his rightful sovereignty over us. And thus we bear God's punishment of this rebellion in separation from God as we turn to evil, to self-obsession and self-determination, which brings us to our deaths. Uh, let me repeat some of our text from last week in Romans 3, where Paul's words describe our human condition. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And Paul then says that we are incapable of upholding any spiritual or moral law that brings us merit or salvation. Whether it is God given or humanly devised, every law, contract, code, doctrine or religion, we fail them all. Religion itself takes us to tradition and to reasoning and experience. And these things fail us because our sin condemns us to endless failure. And the result is, is that because of this universal human failure in sin, we each and all are under God rightly condemned. And we, deceived by sin, will make all sorts of claims of innocence, of personal righteousness and merit. We will maintain that we believe humans are basically good, or we will excuse ourselves with, I'm not as bad as most, or we'll simply consider our failings with indifference or as being inconsequential. But all these responses are symptomatic of the fact that in rejecting God, we have not considered the seriousness of our sin. God is so affronted by our defiance of him. He has said in his word in Genesis 6, 
the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. With our sin, there is a great impasse between us and God. And no matter what sacrifices we make in religion, it is never enough. In our sin, we are incapable of righteousness. So to avoid God's wrath and judgment, someone else must step in and bestow upon us an alien righteousness. So today we come to God's solution to the problem of our sin. And what this requires is God's forgiveness of our sins. And the big question is, how do we receive that forgiveness? Is it really possible that we can be forgiven, that we can be in a right relationship with God? Well, the answer that the writer of this letter to the Hebrews gives us is yes, we can be forgiven. For God himself has provided a rescuer, Jesus, who has come to offer us forgiveness and to bring us back into relationship with God. And this whole letter of Hebrews is about Jesus Christ. In fact, we could sum the letter up in two statements about Jesus. Firstly, Jesus is God's final word. And secondly, Jesus has achieved a finished work. In Jesus, we find everything we need to know about God. And in Jesus, we find one who has given us total rescue. That's what Hebrews is all about. Now, today, as we're focusing on full forgiveness, we will be focusing on the rescue that leads us to God's forgiveness. And the writer to the Hebrews speaks of two ways of being rescued from sin, one of which is wrong and the other which is right. Firstly, the wrong way to be rescued from sin is by religion that is done by us. And we find this in verses one through four. So let's look first at religion that is undertaken by us. And the writer makes it clear that this way of trying to be rescued is doomed to failure. And he shows us this by explaining the failings of the Old Testament sacrificial system. In the Old Testament period, the time long before Jesus, the way the men and women of Israel were to be forgiven for their wrongdoing against God was through the sacrifice of animals. Right from the beginning, God in Genesis 2 made it clear that the penalty for sin was death. Rebellion against God is an incredibly serious offence and its penalty God clearly declared to be to Adam is death. And yet after the fall of humanity into sin, God in his mercy and grace allowed the people to sacrifice animals instead of themselves for their sin. What this meant was a lamb or a goat could take the place as a substitute of the people and it would die in sacrifice for their sins. So every day the priests would offer sacrifices on the people's behalf and the people would be forgiven. But as the writer of Hebrews now shows us, there are three very serious failings with the sacrificial system. Firstly, the failing is, is that the sacrificial system is incomplete. In verse one, we read, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. By law, the writer means the laws concerning the sacrifices, and he says that they were only a shadow of the things which were coming. In other words, these sacrifices were not the real thing. They were signposts pointing to something much better coming later. They were a temporary solution dealing with sin until the coming of the rescuer who brings real rescue. And we might ask therefore, why did God bother with the sacrifices if they were no good or incomplete? Well, I guess ultimately God's timing and his choices of how he does things, they are his own. But also God was teaching the Israelites and he's teaching us a very important reality. The Lord was teaching his people that sin is so significant, it can only be forgiven through the shedding of blood. That is through a death. That is the price God exacts or demands for the wages or the cost of sin, of rebelling against him. 
So in the sacrificial system, the picture or signpost was, a, was a still yet incomplete and there was necessarily more to come. But the sacrificial system wasn't just incomplete because secondly, it was inadequate. Again, in verse one, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. And then in verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The fact is, says the writer, these sacrifices don't actually do the job. They don't take away sins because they don't deal with the guilt behind the sins. It's one thing to go through the rituals and be symbolically clean from sin. It's quite another to have your conscience cleansed and forgiven. So why are they inadequate? Well, simply because an animal can never adequately take the place of a human being. The whole point was, was that something or someone would step into the place of or, or substitute for the sinner. But an animal cannot do that fully because it's not a human. You can't ask a goat if it feels guilty for sin, can you? Your sin. You can't ask a cow if it's willing to step into the place of a human being and take the punishment of a person's sin and, and rebellion against God. It's simply a dumb animal. Animals are totally different from humans because they have no will. They cannot willingly make the decision to step into our shoes, to take our place. So the sacrifices fail at this point because they do not fully deal with the problem of guilt and sin. They are not an adequate sacrifice or a fair exchange. The guilt, the human conscience defiled by wrongdoing still remains. And that is why we need a better rescue that will completely deal with the problem of our guilt so that we can be fully forgiven. In the famous Shakespearean play Macbeth, Lady Macbeth is having a nightmare and she flusters desperately, trying to wash the blood of the murdered Banquio off her hands. But the problem is there's no blood on her hands. She washed that off immediately after Banquio was murdered. So the blood in her dream is her conscience and she cannot wash the guilt away. It stays with her and hounds her for the rest of the story. Now you can do all you want to bury the guilt for your sin, but it never goes away. The stain of sin remains in your conscience, in your mind, in your heart, and like spilt red wine on white carpet, it is impossible to shift apart from a miraculous cleaning agent. And even the most thorough system of animal sacrifices is inadequate for the job of dealing with and cleansing our human guilt. And then finally, the sacrifices are intolerable. Uh, verse three, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Every year in the Israelite calendar, there was a grand theatrical performance called the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would, before all the gathered Israelites, make a highly symbolic sacrifice for the sin of the nation. He did this by bringing forward two rams. One ram he would slaughter with a knife, cutting its throat. He would then take the blood of that ram, cover his hands in it, and then lay his bloody hands on the second ram. The second ram, stained by blood, would then be led out into the desert. It would be released, for in the co blood covering it, the ram carried the sin of the whole nation off into the wilderness where it would die. It was an amazing spectacle. But because of ongoing sin, the performance had to be repeated the next year and the next and the next unceasingly. Just imagine if you were one of those ancient Israelites. Every day, day after day, month after month, year after year, you sacrificed an animal for your sins. Every day would be a bloody reminder 
of just how far short you'd fallen from God. Every day we sin, so every day we'd have to make sacrifice because God said that sins must be paid for by an animal sacrifice. But every time you sacrifice that animal, it would be like a hammer blow to your heart. You are a sinner. You are a sinner. You are a sinner, those sacrifices would say. And it would be never ending because you'd keep on sinning because that is our nature. And it would be unbearable. And our hearts cry out, oh, for a rescue that would deal with our sins once for all. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could find a way of eradicating or cleansing or writing off the debt of sin once and for all, instead of having to come back to God every day with a bloody sacrifice? So essentially, it couldn't be through animal sacrifices that this heartfelt desire for cleansing, for forgiveness would ever be realised. Just as it can't be realised in constant religious experience or rigorous tradition or human spiritual reasoning and moralising, they are just like the ancient Jewish sacrificial system. They are ongoing and unrelenting. There it is. The animal sacrifices were incomplete inadequate and intolerable. And the sacrificial system was always meant to only be a signpost pointing to a better rescue, a perfect rescue that God himself would provide in the future. The whole sacrificial system was a shadow of the coming reality. And in this exposure of the shadow and the reality, the writer is leading us to see the nature of the real atonement we need that would come into the world. You see, we need a rescue that is done for us, which we read of in verses five through 18. And so the writer points us to the coming of Christ into the world in verse five. And he tells us that there is a true and willing sacrifice who steps forward in the midst of the bloodshed of the temple and says, enough, here I am. I'm the reality from which the shadows have projected. I'm the real sacrifice these constant offerings have pointed to. And this is what Jesus came to do. This is why his name means he will save his people from their sins. Jesus said of himself, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to die a violent, shameful death like a sacrificial lamb slaughtered in the Jewish temple, because as God said, sin demands death. And God in his infinite kindness substituted his own son for us, exhausting his wrath upon him whom he loved from all eternity so that we could live for all eternity. Uh, the author David Wells in his book, Search for Salvation, explains Jesus' substitution on our behalf like this. He says, man is alienated from God by sin and God is alienated from man by wrath. It is in the substitutionary death of Christ, sin is overcome and wrath is averted so that God can look on man without displeasure and man can look on God without fear. Jesus, our scapegoat, died the death of every slanderer, every pornographer, every bully, every murderer, swindler, adulterer, terrorist of every sinner. And now in verse 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That phrase, once for all, is just so, so precious because understanding it will transport you from the shadow lands of guilt and perpetual striving to the freedom of Christ's finished work. And to bring home these truths, Hebrews lays out the stark difference between the reality of Christ's sacrifice and the shadow of the old covenant. In verses 11 through 14, where we discover that the old sacrifices were continual whereas Christ's sacrifice was once for all. The old sacrifices were powerless, 
whereas Christ's sacrifice was completely effective. The old priests had to stand for their constant work, but Christ sits having finished his work. In Christ's death on our behalf, there really is forgiveness for our guilt, cleansing for our sin. There is a clean slate given to you by Jesus. It is for free and it is forever. And it comes to us only through Christ's once for all atonement. And the work of Jesus in the removal of our sin is so complete and so full that God even forgets our sins and lawless acts. Jesus' last words on the cross were, it is finished. In the Greek, it is one word, which is tetelestai, which can also be translated, paid in full. Thus, next to our names in God's accounting book, so to speak, written in the blood of Jesus are the words forgiven, debt paid. In our release from sin and in our forgiveness, our religious strivings can cease. We can know peace, such wonderful peace, peace with our God, peace with our conscience, peace with our neighbours. This is what grace is, and it is what grace delivers. So as we finish, let me ask you two questions. Firstly, have you accepted the rescue of Jesus who died for you? This forgiveness is not given automatically. You must admit your pride and your sin and turn to Jesus as the only way to come to God, for you cannot do it on your own. You must accept the rescue that has been undertaken for you. So have you done that? And then secondly, if you have accepted the rescue of Jesus, are you still trusting in his cross? Or have you slipped back into trying to do it all yourself still? Are you living your Christian life by and in guilt? You see, for many Christians, that is the temptation. They live under the heavy burden of thinking they must somehow pay God back, thinking they owe God. We have this funny but sad trait in us that in our pride, we have to square every debt ourselves. We, we don't want to be put in the awkward position of being obliged to someone. And it's a failure in sin in thinking that we can somehow be independent. But your debt of sin, you could never, ever, ever pay. And in Christ's sacrificial death for you, it has been paid in full. Remember that. Look to the cross and remember that your debt of sin has been paid. Yes, you are eternally obliged and indebted to God. So I say to you, give up your pride and stop living by guilt and live by grace, knowing the true freedom of being a child of God. Because that freedom from guilt and shame is the most wonderful outcome of the rescue that has been achieved for us by Jesus Christ. If you've trusted Jesus, your scapegoat, these are God's words to you today. Verse 17 says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. I implore you, do not live in the shadows. Do not live in the slavery of religion and obligation. Don't live in that cycle of seeking to live as good, which can only lead to being crushed by failure. Don't even try to clean yourself up because the Apostle Paul and the writer of Hebrews have made it abundantly clear to us it is just not possible. Remember, from the moment that you trust Jesus Christ, you have been cleansed and fully forgiven through his cross, through his sacrifice, once and for all. How wonderful is that? Amen. As we finish, let me lead you in this blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us. I trust 
Uh, this has been a helpful time to you. What we've considered has been encouraging to you that you are fully forgiven in Jesus Christ. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday in person. Uh, we are going to continue to record the services so that they can go online if you're not able to join us. But now we're going to finish with this great song, Glorious Things of You Are Spoken. The Lord keep you and the Lord bless you. Jesus, whom the souls rely.